Please join me in welcoming our speaker, Michael Lean. Hi, everybody. My name is Michael Lean, grateful alcoholic. I want to thank Tony for having me and um, Tim for getting my name right. That was good. And uh, welcome to all the new people. And thanks to the old timers. Um, it's a big deal to have new people here. I wasn't, they look kind of good to me this morning. I always look at them because that's not what I look like when I got sober. I was a little puffy. And um, <laughs> it's also a lot perkier. My um, sobriety dates June 30th, 1982. And for the new people, um, relapse isn't mandatory. It's one of the options, but it isn't mandatory. And uh, good to see you, Forehead. Um, oh my God, and that's kind of what I was thinking about. So this is kind of what I'm really like now. And the only time I've almost drank in um, the last 30 years is when I began sharing at six years sober what I was like, what happened, and what I wished I was like. Then I was sharing what I was like, what happened, and what I wanted you to think I was like. And then I started sharing what I was like, what happened, and what I thought I should be like. With all that time, six years, I mean, come on. And uh, I didn't want my sponsor to think um, that I hadn't taken a step, because I'd been very hypervigilant in my early sobriety. Um, and it almost got me drunk. So what I've learned um, ever since then is to just tell you what I'm really like today. And this is how I wake up. I ch first I look at my neck almost every morning. <laughs> and then I think about inventing a binder clip. <laughs> and I do several of these rituals every morning before I actually get into prayer and meditation. <laughs> because I know that will make me not think about myself, and I need to think about myself first. Um, or why bother, you know? Why pray or meditate if you're always thinking of others, you know? So, my first thought is think about myself, and um, I just was at the physical therapist yesterday and found out, and this is gonna, maybe not shock some people, but I suffer from self-delusion, that the rest of my body is also in, it's in my 60s. I didn't realize that. <laughs> I know, I mean, it looks like an obvious thing, but competing with a 22-year-old um, on the spin bike has apparently not been a smart idea. <laughs> And my back is so jacked up now. <laughs> she could do it, I can do it, you know. And it's like I'm sweating, I almost die. And I feel firmer somehow, so. <laughs> so anyway, that's what I'm really like. And uh, I just like to think about stupid stuff that's really important and usually shallow. And, um, and then I'll go and I'll read my stuff and I'll say my prayers and, and I'll think about how incredible my life is today because of Alcoholics Anonymous, a loving God, and this um, fellowship. My home group Sunday morning yellow cab and this is what it's like every Sunday morning at our place too. Um, there's energy and abundance and the noise level just goes insane. And then about five minutes before everybody's going to their seat, and then they wait to be inspired. Um, we're not always inspired, but we're waiting to be inspired, <laughs> which is kind of inspiring for about an hour, waiting for the inspiration <laughs> to come, you know. And I want to thank both my daughters for coming up. We're having a mommy-daughter road trip day, and. Um, my daughter's supposed to give me a sign when Green Bay scores, so. <laughs> Sorry, Hetty. Yeah, oh, oh, you did? Okay, so we might, might need to take a break then at 12.20. <laughs> so if anybody's cheating in the back row and has a great, you got it, okay. Give us a sign. And, um, my oldest daughter is here, and she's in the program, and my youngest daughter's here, and she's just grateful we're in it, you know? <laughs> <laughs> and 
everybody joins something in our family. And uh, I want the new people to know that everything I'm laughing about today and I find humor in, I didn't find humor in 30 years ago. I destroyed a family and I self-destructed and I was willing to die drunk um, because I didn't know how to do this. You know, life on life's terms, it was just, it was for real people. I wasn't a real person. And I grew, I was a pretend person. I don't know if you've ever tried to be legitimate when you were not really a legitimate person, but it's very stressful. It'll make you edgy. <laughs> you know, I don't care if you're a doctor, lawyer, Indian chief, Nancy nurse, whatever it is, you know, if you're one of us, there, there's probably a place inside that, that you know you're off. And uh, if you're anything like me, and if you suffer from self-delusion and don't know you're off, other people do. <laughs> Just so you know. Um, it's not paranoia when it's true. And um, I didn't want to be an AA. I love Alcoholics Anonymous. I still love it 30 years later. I'm still invested. Um, I just finally, you know, moved from a year of bathroom cleaner at my home group to I got moved up to literature chair. I had been table cleaner for two years because um, I into cleaning, and um, and now I just got inner group again, and I love being an inner group, and uh, I love my service commitments. I do H and I, and and I still I've done H and I for 29 years and 10 months of my sobriety. And, and so pretty much everything I'm about today and that I do today was what I was taught to do when I got here. And I haven't rested on my laurels because I don't have a mild case of alcoholism. Um, I think that I, it's more important for somebody with a big mouth like me to invest and sign up for more service commitments because um, I don't want to ever buy my own press. And um, I used to do that. I bought my own press before I got here. None of it was actually true, but I bought it. And this is how I kind of started. I was raised in Phoenix um, at St. Agnes. And if you're from my generation and you're kind of neurotic, what you will actually do is um, become a nun. And uh, <laughs> that's what weird little girls did that went to Catholic school. and then. You were just too weird to be mainstream, so I love black and white. I love the colors. I like beads. I like the ambiance. I like candles and statues and the mystique of the Catholic Church. I loved it all. And um, so I had decided to join our order, which was the Blessed Virgin Mary Order, also known as BVMs. And uh, I loved them. I just thought they were so cool and neurotic and scary all at the same time. And when I went to school, if you misbehave, they didn't have Saturday school, but if you misbehave, which means laughing, laughing at Mon Senior at communion, that's misbehaving in Catholic school. And you would get an hour of detention, they didn't call it that, penance is what they called it, and you were supposed to go to the convent every Saturday and you'd clean for one hour for your misbehavior. And I, was, I spent hours at the convent of the Blessed Virgin Mary order every Saturday of my life. Um, I would commit sins against Monsignor usually, because he was funny, um, just to go. There's something, I come from five generations of crazy people, alcoholics, and uh, everything but mass murderers so far in our family. And so I love that safety net in there. And I would go there all the time and then I had my first drink at a um, party where there were no nuns present. And that had not ever, I'd never even been out of the little circle. And um, I had my first drink and that night um, bad things happened and the next day I couldn't be a nun and I couldn't join that order. <laughs> I'm sharing in a general way, but get it? <laughs> so, you know, what I did was I, I do have, a, I, I'm a backup plan person. It's what I do. I come up with backup plans. I'm very strategic in my thinking. And my backup plan was to become a go-go dancer. And 
So that's what I did. And I got a job. I secured a position uh, at a place called the Pirates Den in Phoenix. And there were little cages and little outfits. And like I said, I was perky. And um, this is how old I am. Minimum wage was 65 cents an hour. That was subtle. (laughs) My husband just went, he's a ma. You know, it's like, but it's true. And so $4 an hour cash and tips was monumental money. And what I decided to do by my 15th, um, 15th birthday was because I really wasn't cut out to be a nun. Um, and I really wasn't cut out to be a go-go dancer, but everything was part of the plan. I, I just had to keep changing the plan, you know. And so my new plan, and some of you will be old enough to know who Donna Reed is, but <laughs> she is my idol. I'm, I'm lo- I look around, oh my God, I love your pearls, you know. I mean, that's how I kind of am. And I loved her pearls. I loved that she stood by the front door and made little lunches for her little children. And she made little meatloafs, and she just was so perfect. And uh, I thought, I'm going to be like Donna Reed. I have not been a successful child, I admit it. And I'm going to go to California and get a sailor to marry me and get a puppy and whatever else Donna did, you know. So you kind of had to watch the episodes to see what you were supposed to do next, but (laughs) basically that's how my story went. I'd have an idea, um, it'd go in my mind, it would be so brilliant I didn't know that it might be a challenge at all. I'm like a shaker, mover, get it done, make it happen person. And I would do that. Um, I'd never actually been to high school, but what I realized in those days was that you didn't really need to go, go. You needed to know where the campus was, and you needed to put it in, in writing because nobody checked. If you're wearing pearls, they're not checking your resume in those days because they didn't have computers. They just believed people that looked believable. And so I wanted to enroll in City College, and I have beautiful children, and committed till death do us part to be an incredible mom. And um, I, my pro- one of my problems, okay, I have more than one, but one of my primary problems was I love good-looking alcoholics with potential. <laughs> I really didn't like drinking. I liked martyrdom. And... <laughs> So I'm sorry if I'm offending the Al-Anons out there, but you know how we are. We're the good ones, they're the bad ones. And then they do bad things, and we're wonderful and understanding and forgiving, and we get a couch. (laughs) And we got a lot of furniture, didn't we, out of that one. I mean, it was just (laughs) crazy. But I liked being the good one, you know, and forgiving and understanding. And I would... I filled up that big spiritual hole inside of me that I had with every single thing first before I turned to alcohol. And and that was just my story. It wasn't my drug of choice. Suffering was my drug of choice. Accomplishing was my drug of choice. I had a million other drugs of choice before I ever got to alcohol. The only deviation from that kind of rationale was in the 60s when I got a little chubby after pregnancy and my doctor gave me diet pills and they were prescription and they were totally safe and you can believe everything your doctor says when they're not not addictive and I got really thin the house got really cleaner and I got really addicted but other than that I mean there's they're useful items. <laughs> I like those. Um, I still wish we could use some of those things today because I could use a boost every once in a while. <laughs> but I know that's not AA approved, so I, I haven't, but so far. 
And that's just basically how our life went. We talk about our life in so many different ways, about camping trips and the neighborhood Christmas parties and where I would get the Santa from our neighbor across the street and he'd bring in presents and we'd have real to real little kid movies. And, and um, this is what I know about the progressive disease of alcoholism. You can get it without your permission. It takes your full participation, but you can get it without your permission. I would have never given my permission to have something so traumatic. For myself and people that I really loved, I wouldn't have done that on purpose. So coming here and finding out that you're powerless over something, I didn't really buy it at first, but it became the good news for me. Because I thought it was an on purpose disease, and that's what I thought about the other people that I loved in my family that had it, was I thought it's an on purpose disease. I didn't realize it's a by accident disease. I've never met anybody who said, I hope I can have a family and destroy it all. I hope I can work hard for things and destroy a career. I mean, I really hope I can kind of go down that path. But if you have a powerless, you're powerless over um, a disease like I am, you're going to make a mess. And you're going to feel really bad, which will make you have to drink some more because you feel so bad, which will make another mess. And it's kind of this three ring circus that I got going on. And it really wasn't until after my divorce that it went nuts. And if you've used somebody that everything that's gone wrong in the family is their fault and they don't live there anymore, it's more of a challenge to blame it on them. I found post-traumatic stress disorder before it was in vogue. I said, it must be from that, it must still be from him. Why would I make such bad decisions? And so I ended up just getting alcoholism by accident. I don't know about your story, I just know about mine, and I just wanted to relax a little bit. That was my intent. I'm gonna relax. I'm gonna take off the edge. I'm gonna regroup so I can accomplish more and make it. And we're gonna be okay, and it's gonna go okay. And then it got a little bit worse. And it, it all happened, remember Sally Blake? You know, it's like, they all went. There were several uh, people, I didn't know anybody who was divorced in La Mesa. I mean, I didn't know them. And she was married and she had a couple of other friends, but they, once a month, they went to um, Stardust Country Club and they went dancing. And they kept inviting me and I just thought, no. I mean, a nice woman, Donna Reed, would never be seen in a bar. Can you even imagine that? It wouldn't happen. So I said, no, 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 until finally I said yes. Then when you say yes, then you realize, oh my God, this is the best thing I've ever done, because I'm very relaxed. I don't know if you've drank much, but it will relax you. <laughs> Whoa, was I relaxed, you know, and I thought, why would I wait a month, have a month's worth of tension to wait to be relaxed. I might as well relax right along and stay in the zone, <laughs> you know? And that's really what I thought was gonna happen. And then when I decided it was, it had gone nuts, um, I decided not to do that anymore and found that I couldn't. I had progressed to a point where I didn't have options anymore. I could say I wasn't gonna go and I could say I wasn't gonna drink, but I was gonna drink. And June 29th um, is my regular birthday. And uh, the kids were all standing around the bed upstairs in my bedroom. And I think I'd been home maybe three, four hours. Um, totally swollen face, which I thought was from sinuses. And um, I had acute alcohol poisoning. And they were, we also did Walton's birthday themes at my house because I got into the Waltons. And, um, <laughs> And on Walton's Mountain, everybody stands around your bed in the morning and they sing happy birthday and you don't have chores on your birthday because you're on Walton's Mountain and it's very special. <laughs> yeah. Well, if you're going to die from alcoholism, you don't want to eat because food in your stomach will make you so sick. 
it's not all the alcohol you're concerned it's food for some reason was the thing that would just trigger a response and I would almost die so I pushed him away and said I couldn't eat it and made my oldest son cry who's also in recovery thank God um because now he gets it but I couldn't eat it and uh so I promised him I wouldn't drink that day, and I meant it. And I had not even thought of not drinking. It's the only way I was surviving was, you know, not drinking. And I had kind of planned to kill myself a couple weeks ago without actually um, any ideation about how I was going to do it. What I was going to do was wake up dead. I wasn't sure how to pull it all off, <laughs> but I. I couldn't be here anymore because I couldn't figure out what to do anymore and I'd always been able to figure out what to do and if you have if you're powerless over alcohol it's taking you where you didn't plan on going and you don't get a choice anymore I didn't know this but it was taking me and I didn't want to go and I was going anyway it made no sense to me it just it just happened and it kept happening and so when I said I wouldn't drink all day and I'd take him someplace and write another hot check for dinner, make it special. If I would have taken him where I could afford to go, we would have had a crummy dinner. Well, why have a crummy dinner when you can write a check and have a great dinner? You know, my new financial strategy, and uh, which I still like, but I'm not doing that anymore. Um, and I can't go two hours without a drink anymore. I had to start drinking at work. I'd gotten a promotion. Um, I had just landed the hospice contract for San Diego County in a blackout. I have no memory. I'm good. I mean, what can I say? I don't want to toot my own horn, but I have no memory. I have memory of preparing it. I have a memory of starting up the stairs, but I had had a little bit to drink just to relax me before going, and apparently we won. <laughs> That that's good news. I don't. I wish I would have been there. You know. <laughs> so two hours was too long, and I had to leave and drink and lie, and that's what it, my alcoholism did. I had to leave and lie, and leave it, leave and lie. That was what I had to do. I had to lie and then leave. I just couldn't say, well, I'm. I can't make it. I don't even think I knew that I couldn't go two hours without a drink. I just because I drank. So, but that's longer, two hours. And I just, I woke up, um, came to out of a blackout. I didn't know where I was. I didn't know where the kids were. And that had never happened. And I did a prayer that I wasn't sure would work because I hadn't prayed for a long time because I'm not an idiot. Growing up, they gave me 10 things they wanted me to do. And I'm not, I understand them. I could not follow through so why would God help me I mean it's not rocket science these were called commandments as opposed to steps but I had moral and philosophical convictions galore and I couldn't live up to them as much as I tried and I tried and I tried and I tried but I couldn't live up to them I liked them wanted to be like that I just couldn't pull it off and so I said the prayer, I said, I'm not sure if you're there and I'm not sure if you're going to kick in, but if you are there, um, you better do something because this is so bad. I don't know what happened. I don't know what to do. And the next thing I knew, I was on the phone with a central office, which I didn't know to call. I had no idea that joining AA was going to be the answer. I, I, I mean, because you know what those people are like. You know, it's like, that's not me. But it was me, and this lady named Flo, oh my God, I just started vomiting information. She asked me a question, I went, Wah. you know, and I had never told anybody the whole truth. I wasn't even sure what the whole truth was. If I'd attended, if I'd attended a workshop at a campus, I had become a poli-sci major. <laughs> it then went on my resume. I'd actually been to the campus. I felt like if I would have gone and graduated, that would have been the year I would have graduated. The whole thing was thrown off a little bit. I didn't actually get my credentials till after I'd been sober seven years, but whatever, you know. But I told Flo the truth, and, and she said, I, you're not going to have to 
drink anymore and I'm going to take you to be an AA and it'll be okay. And I believed her. And I joined. Right at that moment, I hadn't been yet, but I was joining because she was so good with me. And till two hours later when it's like, oh my God, you know, I'm pulling my own hair. I'm sweating. I'm very physically uncomfortable. And I have no idea I'm detoxing. I have no idea what's really happening to me. Um, and so she had said, call me before you drink. And I thought, oh God, thank God. You know, you can drink here. They want you to check in, <laughs> you know. <laughs> Call before you drink, not call instead of drinking. She didn't say that. So I called her, you know, because I'm like, I'm done. I mean, I said, I still want to be an AA, but I'm going to have to drink and be an AA, and I'm never going to make it. And this thing sober, you know, it's too long. I mean, it's like, geez, been two hours and eight minutes, you know, it's just too much. And then she went, blah, 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 and, um, uh, I went, no, I'm not going to drink. I'm going to be an AA, you know. So I, until two hours later when you realize, I mean, it's like, I, I need to relax. I'm going to explode from my nerves. I will explode. My skin will split into pieces. Not that I want to be dramatic, but it's not going to be pretty. So I thought, I, you know, now it's been like four hours, and I'm just like hyperventilating, you know, because I'm just too long, so I call her first, because you're supposed to call first, and I said, you know, I don't want to get drunk, and I'm not going to go anywhere, I'm just going to have a couple of drinks to relax so I can be an AA, I can, I'm too tense to be an AA, you know, I don't know if you've ever been sober all day, but it's a little stressful, you know, it's just like, blah. When I go to H and I, I swear to God, the people on the mats look relaxed. The H and I panel looks tense, <laughs> and we're trying to get them to join us. <laughs> you know, which doesn't make sense. You know, so you have to know how to sell this thing when you're like this, and they're like, "Well, you know." But that's what the first day was like. And so finally I said, I, I have to put your foot down with these people. They're like fanatics, you know, and just, you know, I'm going to, but you have to call first. Once you've said you join, you have to call first. So I'm like, that's it. I'm going to put my foot down. I'm going to tell her this. I'm going to do this. I hadn't poured the wine yet, but I am going to. And they can't not let me. It's my, you know, you have to get an attitude if you have alcoholism because you're going to go do something stupid again. And so I call her. I'm ready to put my foot down. I'm going to get, you know, a glass of wine, relax a little bit so I can be an AA because I was still joining. And what I said was, if you don't hurry up and get here, I won't be able to be an AA. And there, you know. <laughs> It's like, never give them your address unless you're serious, you know, because she was like, there. And they didn't even have cell phones in 82, you know. A few doctors with the big ones, but that was it, you know. And it's like, she's there, and she's saving my life. And she, as soon as she walked through the door, though, I was fine. Crazy. I'm going to have a nervous breakdown and die and decompose and maybe implode. And then she walks in the house, this hick named Flo, from Lakeside, California, who had almost a year, who, which is to newcomer, that's like 35 years, you know, it's like, get a grip, you know. And she's like babysitting me so I could be an AA. And I remember saying to the kids, I said, you know, I'm going to be an AA. And they're like, okie dokie, you know. <laughs> Had to be a Girl Scout leader, had to be a den mother, had to be president of Bobby Sox. You know, it's like, now I'm going to be an AA. It's like, no, I'm, I'm going to be an AA. And I said, how long does this take? And she goes, about an hour. I said, I'll be home at 9 o'clock or 9.30. And I think it was shower. She goes, in the morning? <laughs> and I was mortified because that was true. But still, I didn't want somebody to know, you know that sometimes it was nine in the morning. And they took me, they let me join. And some guy named Joe had 30 days and, 
And he said, I'm Joe, I'm an alcoholic, and I have 30 days, and I didn't understand the significance of the 30-day deal. And so I said, oh, man, I got to say my name, I'm an alcoholic, and I'm like, Joe, Joe the monkey girl, you know, trying to figure it all out. And, and uh, I said, I'm Michaeline, I'm an alcoholic, I didn't even know I was one, and I have 11 hours. And they went nuts. <laughs> I thought... I mean, more applause for me than Joe with 30 days. So I thought it's like a golf score or something, you know. <laughs> the lower the score, the lower the time, the better it is. I was like, and if you've led the life I was leading, you're going to join anybody who's really proud of you. I joined. That night, they were so proud of me. They got me. I didn't have to say I'd been a ba become a bad mom. I had I'd become a drunk. I had just become a disgusting person. I was powerless over alcohol. It was leading me all over the place. I didn't have to say anything except my name, that I was alcoholic, and I had 11 hours. They knew my story. It, it's crazy. And they said things like, you know, some are sicker than others. And I looked around, and I went, no kidding, how sad, <laughs> you know. <laughs> it was like picking them out, you know. It was like, uh, it was crazy, though. I was just like, I didn't know they meant me. I didn't know that sometimes having a lot going for you could be a drawback here. And I felt like I had so much that I tried to do or accomplished or whatever. I didn't even know how I got this thing. And everything began to unfold. And I was sitting at my desk and I'd just gotten a promotion about three or four months before I got sober, February of 82. And I was sitting at my desk after a couple of weeks and I'm looking at this and I'm just like, I really don't know how to do this job. I am so in over my head. I don't even know how I got this promotion, um, but I'm not even, I'm, no, I'm definitely not qualified for it. <laughs> I know I might have done it for 13 years, but whoa. Um, and so I walked in and I said, I have to leave now. I have to go. Um, I'm, I'm an alcoholic. And the director said, really? I thought, yeah, I was bad. I'm, I've been drinking here. I can't. <laughs> She goes, really? I said, oh, yeah, bad. I, I'm in AA now. And she goes, really? I said, oh, yeah, I'm bad. And you, have to, you have to go every day. And I said, I'm not going to be able to stay here. I'm not even qualified to do this. She goes, well, take the day off. I said, oh, no, I'm resigning. There is no way I can work and be in AA. There's just too much. It's too much for me. And I meant it, you know, and I remember going home and sitting in my mental patient rocking chair going nowhere, <laughs> waiting for somebody to pick me up because I can drive while drinking. Um, I can't drive sober. <laughs> too much, too stressful, you know. And so I remember, you know, it was just the kids are going, what is wrong with you? I said, I, I'm in AA now, and it's all going to be fine. And I quit my job. And, you know, one of the other problems I had was mail. And I had come up with the latest financial strategy, you know, my new plan was that mail was bumming me out, making me feel stress. One, because I'm not going to pay, pay it because I might need my money, so why give it to them because I might need it the next week? It's just too much. So, and I was getting depressed opening my mail, so I decided if you don't actually owe it, I mean open it, you don't actually owe it. <laughs> Be, and then you're not going to bum yourself out what, with what you're not going to pay. You don't even know what you're not paying. <laughs> and it worked for a couple of months because I was more relaxed, you know, like whatever. And... Um, but part of some of the stuff in the mail was the house, go figure, and our stuff, and uh, the car, of course, you know, they need their, they wanted to be paid. Crazy, huh? <laughs> Every month, I mean, it was too much for me, but. And the kids just got, had to go away for a while. They had to go away for a while because I could not function sober. 
drunk I, is like super glue for a while. It will hold me together. Sober was like, it's like being naked here today. I, I mean, everybody looks kind of prettied up, and I'm sure some of you went to great effort to do it. I know I did. <laughs> suck it up, push it up, pull it back, you know. <laughs> Not easy. And, uh, you know, so I get up here and nobody's going to get sick. You know, they look at me, I look okay, whatever. But if I was naked, I could clear the room. I just, and that's what for me being sober is like. It's like being naked. No props. And around you guys, it's like, I, I don't even want to try to act like I'm somebody I'm not or be someplace I'm not or act like I know something I don't know. I did m that my whole life. I wanted to become a real legitimate person in a safe place where one of the prerequisites is that you have to be screwed up to join. <laughs> I've joined a lot of things where one of the prerequisites is if you are screwed up, keep it to yourself. <laughs> we don't want to know. Um, image is everything, you know, but there, here it, it's not like that for me. Here it has really been like, get the sponsor, take the steps, learn the traditions, have service commitments, and you know, what I really wanted, I got to live in a 14-foot camping trailer for um, over 10 months with red shag carpeting, which is not one of my colors, you know. It's, <laughs> I mean, now it's better, but I didn't really love it. And I'm not a camper. <laughs> I got a bicycle instead of a car, and I'm not a bicyclist. And I got a job making sandwiches in a deli because an old timer thought, you know, if you were a mom, you made sandwiches, you could do it. Hey, you. And uh, it was just kind of like that's what my life was really like. It wasn't fun for any of us um, for me to get sober. I frequently look back and I think me getting sober was harder on my family than my drinking. But it was real and I had to start from the bottom up. And joining uh, Alcoholics Anonymous was a step up for me. And so, you know, I wanted a boyfriend to be in AA with me because sometimes that's more fun. Talk about God because it could be God's will, and go to A dances, and hopefully he'd have a car and a MasterCard because I needed something, you know. And uh, my sponsor would say, you know, you're looking for Prince Charming, and he's looking for a princess, and you're not one. Ow. It was true, but I mean, ow, you know. It's like I had nothing to offer. And so I was supposed to make sure my relationship with him was right and great events had come to pass for me and countless others. And for me, that had always been my husband. I was trying to make sure my relationship with him was right always. That was my whole life story. And great events were supposed to come to pass for me and countless others, and great events didn't come to pass. But these steps started turning me around backwards. And like everything I wanted for me, I was supposed to start giving. And I was supposed to, instead of worrying about my dad being a great dad, I was supposed to become a great daughter. And instead of, I mean, it's like I thought I was kind of had the good mom thing going on until I tried to raise them by principles, set boundaries. I didn't have any boundaries for myself. What my, my youngest son, he's home from Afghanistan right now, and his room's actually a mess. I just want that on tape. But... Um, <laughs> We had gone through a thing when they were young, and I was just, you know, a couple of years sober, and, you know, we were home and back in a place, and, and I walked down the room, and I worked all day, and I'd gone back into healthcare and yada, yada, and, you know, I go with racing in the house, and that one needed to get to brownies, and he needed to get to wrestling, and here we go again, you know, I remember why I drank then, and... You know, and the oldest one, my oldest son needed to get someplace else, and I just walked down the hall, and I went, this room makes me sick. And he just looked at me, and he walked down the hall to my room, and he opened the door, and he goes, this room makes me sick. And I was like, oh. So family meeting, you know, one of the kids' favorite things to hear, family meeting. But it was such a profound effect on me in terms of how to live my life as a sober woman, as a sober mom, as a sober anybody. 
is that if I can't get it, I can't teach it. If I can't teach it, if that isn't my experience, I better know somebody that does have that experience. And all of the things I started to do and kept doing, you know, did put us together. I got together with an incredible person um, when I was ready to be with an incredible person. And he was talking up here somewhere one night, um, almost 13 years ago, and he just dropped dead after he got done talking. And he was with a couple of his sponsees on the way home, and and I was had been home, and I had seen a sponsor at the mall, and Don used to go through bedroom slippers like it was crazy. You know, I don't know how men did that, but it was like blah, 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 blah. And so I was at the mall buying these really expensive slippers because I thought he needed good slippers, sturdy ones, expensive ones. And I'd seen a sponsor that day, and, I, and he said, what are you doing? And I said, I'm buying Don something really, really expensive. Don't tell him how much I spent or where you saw me because he'll die if he finds out how much they cost. Okay, so he dies that night. <laughs> and so, you know how the AA is, it's so everybody's raced into the hospital and it's too late and he's gone and everybody's, <laughs> you know, and it's not good and we're shocked because he got a clean bill of health on Friday and he dies Sunday and the whole thing's crazy and so we all head back to my house and grab some kids and start making phone calls later on but we're sitting there and his sponsor was also his best friend and they were laughing and I mean it, they just laughed together and so he and I are sitting there drinking coffee and just kind of everybody had gone home and Christy had fallen asleep in front of the fireplace and we're just kind of grasping it and he looks at me looked up and I felt, almost felt so sorry for him as I did for me and and he just said do you think somebody called him? I said, what? <laughs> he said, do you think somebody called him and told him how much he spent on the slippers? <laughs> I said, I don't think so, but they could have because he said he died and he's definitely dead. Well, that's funny. You got to admit. I mean, that is funny. And we started laughing, and that's what that next year looked like around my house. It was like just lots of tears, lots of missing, um, and a lot of laughter, you know? And it was because I, I spoke at the same meeting he spoke at two, two weeks later or three weeks later, I think it was around, maybe after the memorial, and somebody said, you know, let me take it for you, I'll go for you. And I'm like still kind of shell-shocked going through the motions, and I said, I think I better go. I said, well, you don't need to. People would understand if you didn't go. And I said, I know. But I said, one, I want to be where he was. And uh, two, if you don't keep your commitments because you're having a bad day here, you're going to have a bunch of them. And then you're not going to keep your commitments. And it's kind of like marriage for me, better, worse, sickness, and health, richer, or poor, and I've done it all here. So I went and I talked that night. I don't think I was overly useful, but whatever, I did it, you know. And, and I, I don't remember it, but what happened to me at the end was a newcomer came up to me. And he said, you know, I wanted to come here and tell you. I was there that night and I heard his talk and it really helped me. I was getting ready to go out. And I was re ready to, as soon as the meeting was over, I was going to get a bottle. And he said, when he said this, I realized that if he could do it, I could do it. And he said, I wanted to let you know that's what he, what he did that night for me. And I just started, oh, you know. And I just thought, I could have missed that all if I would have stayed home, dressed in black, listened to Merle Haggard, and just <laughs> suffered, which is what I felt like doing. So, you know, I have a life today beyond anything I can imagine, and that doesn't mean it's perfect. It just means it's beyond anything I can imagine. My kids love me today. They can count on me no matter what and vice versa. And that's all I'd ever really wanted. Um, they understand that Alcoholics Anonymous comes first for us to have our life together. And I have so much to be thankful for for Thanksgiving this year. Um, and I've had it even when he wasn't here. So I just want to say thanks.